Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the fourth of five days of our Genocide Awareness Week here at Arizona State University. Um, great to have you all here. My name is John Carlson. I direct the Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life, which is just across the way there. We are one of many co-sponsors uh, of, of Genocide Awareness Week and, uh, and really thrilled to be so. Um, if you've spent any time in the Valley, uh, you know that uh, Genocide Awareness Week is a long-standing feature and um, of, of, the, uh, of the community. Uh, it's uh, been featured regularly on uh, NPR. You just, it's just in the air. You, you know about it. Uh, and it's been for many, many years at uh, Scottsdale Community College under the very able leadership of John Lifton. Uh, and uh, about a a couple of years ago, I, among many others, was approached about the possibility, the, first of all, the certainty of the imminent retirement of, uh, of John Lifton and uh, the necessity of ensuring that the work of Genocide Awareness Week continued uh, after his retirement. And so the question was posed, can we bring this Genocide Awareness Week here to ASU? And uh, uh, I immediately said, yes, of course, this is a question, along with many, many, many other people, and said, look, if we pool our resources, we can, we can make this happen. Uh, and so I just wanted to um, acknowledge the important leadership role of uh, Volker Bankert in making that happen, uh, and others like uh, Timothy Langle, and, and too many people to, uh, to probably list here uh, whose either work, their scholarship, uh, or their deep, deep interest in ensuring that the work of Genocide Awareness Week continues. Uh, and, and I'm only too happy to be a, a bit player in this, uh, uh, in this enterprise, uh, but to, to offer what, uh, what I can and what we in the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict can. I just say a little bit about the, the work that we do. Uh, for, for us, the study of religion and conflict is a, is a big umbrella. It can stretch, it can range from anything like religion and it's the role it plays in questions of genocide or mass atrocities as we're going to be talking about today, uh, all the way to the other end of the spectrum to the role that religion can play in social conflict like the civil rights movement. Um, it's understood to be a force in the world. It can be a force for good or for ill. And usually that force has to go, the questions of for good or ill go to human nature and human beings rather than to religion itself. So I'd invite you to learn a little bit more about the work that we do. And I'll just mention one thing. Um, I Some of you may be all uh, lectured out by the end of this week, but if you're not and you've still got, uh, got the weekend to, to recuperate, uh, on Monday, uh, April 11th at 6.30 p.m., there will be the John P. Frank Lecture featuring Masha Gessen, uh, who's a staff writer from the, for the New Yorker, an activist, uh, a writer, author, best-selling author, who thinks very, very deeply and, uh, and thinks aloud publicly, too, uh, on, you'll see, you'll see Masha on uh, many, many outlets uh, in uh, MSNBC, et cetera, and uh, you can see um, Masha's work, and now come and hear directly from Masha on uh, on Monday at six thirty p.m. The title of uh, their talk is um, "The State of Democracy and the Pursuit of Justice." Uh, six thirty Armstrong Hall. So I invite you to uh, to uh, to join the many many sponsors uh, of that. That's the School of Social Transformation and. Uh, that's that's lead on that unit again. Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict is one of the co-sponsors, and very very happy to be so. Okay, so let's uh, turn to our uh, lecture today. One just brief housekeeping matter. It's sometimes good to remind folks to check your cell phones. You don't want to be that guy or that gal who uh, uh, discovers that the phone is off, and that's usually the reminder I use for myself to make sure that I'm not. All right, there we go. We're good. Okay. Okay, so let's turn to our, uh, our lecture today. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you now uh, Dr. James Waller, from, uh, who is the Cohen Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College. Uh, he also serves as Director of Academic Programs for the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities, which is an international non-governmental organization devoted to atrocity prevention. He's the author of six books, most notably his award-winning book, Becoming Evil, How Ordinary People Commit Genocide and Mass Killing. I can't stress enough how important this concept is that what 
sometimes seems as extraordinary evil is really in many cases banal. It comes from the ordinary. Uh, and it's something to, to remember in our current moment, particularly as we're thinking about and understanding the role and learning sadly more and more about what's happening uh, in Ukraine. <clears throat> His other books include Confronting Evil, Engaging Our Responsibility to Prevent Genocide, and A Troubled Sleep, Risk and Resilience in Contemporary Northern Ireland. The themes and issues that he's going to be uh, talking about today are of, of paramount importance, and we are so honored and so privileged to have him here today for his talk entitled The Escalating Risk of Mass Violence in the United States. Please join us in welcoming James, Dr. James Waller. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the important fact that I'm learning with you today on land that 22 different Native nations have inhabited over the centuries, and I'm honored to be able to be with you here today on that land. It's good to see uh, many of you are friends who I've known before from other conferences and times together in genocide studies, my friends here from the FBI who have heard the Becoming Evil lecture so many times, they could now give it themselves. So fortunately, we don't have to continue that today. Um, my work, as John mentioned, Becoming Evil, that work still continues today. I've interviewed over 225 alleged and convicted perpetrators of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity across the world through Latin America, Africa, former Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, Northern Ireland. And I keep telling people a third edition of Becoming Evil is coming, but other books keep jumping in the way of that third edition. So it will get there. If any of you want to write it for me, I'd be very grateful and then we could get it out to you more quickly. Uh, today, we wanna to talk about a very specific case study, the escalating risk of mass violence in the US. And as background for this, I wanna mention uh, the two books, John mentioned the introduction because they're what brought me to this particular topic. In 2016, I published a book with Oxford, Confronting Evil, Engaging Our Responsibility to, to Prevent Genocide. And that book talked about genocide prevention before crisis happens, while crisis is happening, and after the crisis is over. So for instance, even today in Ukraine, to think that prevention of atrocities has failed is not our best way of thinking about prevention. Because we're in the midst of crisis, there are still things that can be done, even though the crisis has already broken out. And there'll certainly be things we have to do once the crisis is over. But chapter four in Confronting Evil focused on early warning, risk assessment. What are the risk factors that we look at? If you come to us with any country in the world, and you ask a simple question, to what degree is this country at risk of mass atrocity? What are the best quantitative indicators we have, systematic indicators we can look at to give us some estimate? Now, like most people in the field of genocide studies, I would argue that every country in the world is at risk of genocide and mass atrocities. We simply differ in the level of risk. So the risk factors help us get a sense of what countries do we have the greatest concern about? That book was followed last year by a Troubled Sleep, a specific case study on Northern Ireland. I was an uh, honorary visiting research professor at Queen's University in Belfast for a semester during sabbatical. And I took the risk framework I had developed in Confronting Evil and I applied it specifically to the case study of Northern Ireland because I knew the impact that Brexit was gonna have on Northern Ireland and the issues of constitutional national identity, which had become very important. Before a Troubled Sleep came out, I was asked by an NGO in Iowa by the name of the Stanley Center for Peace, Peace and Security. Sorry, they changed their name recently. Stanley Center for Peace and Security to write a policy briefing addressing the potential for the risk of mass violence in the US. This briefing was written and published in early November, 2020. So before the election, it was actually a follow-up to a piece another policy center had asked me to write in 2017 about the escalating risk of mass violence in the US. And in this piece, it came out November, 2020, I had predicted that the risk of mass violence in the US, some episode of mass violence was very high and likely in the time period between the election and inauguration. I think 
like most people, and I wasn't certainly the only one pointing out those risks, but I'm not sure any of us really thought it would come to fruition. We didn't think we would see what we saw on January 6th. But unfortunately, if you looked at the issues of risk, January 6th, while it might not be seen as inevitable, was certainly, I think, foreseeable to a large degree. So in our time together, I want to um, lay out uh, a few things. One, how do we assess risk of mass violence in any country? We're going to look at the four categories I focus on of governance, conflict history, economic conditions, and social fragmentation, and look specifically at those with the case study of the U.S., and then we'll conclude by asking what this means for us and how we understand our way forward. I'll start with these competing metaphors because in the field of genocide studies, I think for a long time, we thought about the onset of mass atrocities, large-scale mass violence as this black swan. I was speaking to a group a couple months ago and evidently in Australia, black swans aren't that unusual. So just take Australia off your mind for now. In the rest of the world, black swans are pretty unusual. You see it, they stand out. You didn't see it coming. They're singular, they're exceptional. You just didn't anticipate that, that you could see a thing like this. I think for a long time in genocide studies, we thought about the onset of atrocities like this, that when it started, we just didn't see it coming. Who could see this coming? How can you imagine people could do anything like this? John mentioned in the introduction, I work with an NGO called the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. And over the 15 years of our existence, we've educated now over 9,000 government officials, security sector personnel from now, I believe more than 92 countries around the world on issues of genocide prevention. And very often one of the responses we'll get from those particular actors is this sense of, it's always surprising when this type of violence breaks out. So part of what we're having to work against is this black swan metaphor, that it's unusual, you can never see it coming. I think the better metaphor is the charging gray rhino. We know what risk looks like. We know what puts countries at risk. We can see it coming. We can look ahead of us. We can see when it's ready to charge. We know the types of things that are gonna trigger it. And so today for policymakers and even civil society actors to say, we just didn't see this coming. How could we be prepared for something like this? How could we believe people keep doing this to each other? There's no excuse for that any longer. We know what the risk looks like. We can have a clear idea of what we see coming. So what I had looked at in confronting evil was I had looked at all the models of risk assessment that existed in the field at the time, which were over 24, 25 different models. And from those, I tried to pull out what are the risk factors we have the most quantitative evidence for that are, that are structural, that are systemic, that we have a chance to think about in terms of prevention. Because if we know what puts our country at risk, we also then know how we can decrease that risk. So if we think, for instance, for you and I of the risk of heart disease, every single one of us is at risk. We differ in the levels of risk, but we know the factors that increase the risk. If we know the factors that increase the risk, we also know the types of things we can do to decrease that risk. So I grouped these risk factors in the four categories of governance, memory, economic conditions, and social fragmentation. And this isn't the time or place to go through all the risk factors in every category, but I just wanna introduce you briefly to what I'm looking at in these risk factors. And again, think with you about what this means for the US. In issues of governance, often one of uh, the five factors that we look at here are type of regime. We know that mature democracies, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to find mature democracies around the world. Mature democracies are safest for minority populations. They tend to be the most stable, tend to be most peaceful. Unfortunately, we're seeing those democracies decline year after year after year. State legitimacy deficit is an issue. To what degree do people in the state perceive the state to be legitimate? How strong or weak are state structures? And to what degree there's identity-based polar factionalism and governance? 
and to what degree there's systematic state-led discrimination. So if a country were to come to me and say, in terms of our risk assessment, what, to, what are the things we'd look at for governance? These would be the five features. So for instance, I work often in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina has very difficult problems with state legitimacy. Now we turn our attention away from Bosnia because the violence is over, the same way we turn our attention away from Northern Ireland. The violence is just transformed. It's still there. And Bosnia and Herzegovina, you can speak with students of university age who simply tell you they can't afford to go to university. They have no way forward. They have no future because they can't afford it. But also, if you know Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know that higher education is covered. It's tuition free. They can go. What, what do they mean when they say they can't afford it? What they mean is on day one of their classes, most of their professors will stand up and say, if you want an A in the course, this is what it will cost you. If you want a B, this is how much it will cost you. That's the level of corruption, that it can be that obvious and that upfront. In states with that high level of corruption, there's strong questions about the legitimacy of the state. Um, let's focus just generally as we talk about governance on issues of democracy, since I mentioned that just a few minutes ago. This is the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. I was teaching in Berlin at the time. Um, I'm not taking claim for the fall of the wall. You can, you can draw those dots. I was there, the wall came down. Uh, when the wall came down in 1989, it was a a moment of incredible hope in the field of political science and political psychology, because we saw when the wall came down, these previously authoritarian autocratic states now began to move to democracy throughout Eastern Europe, some in Africa, some in Latin America. And it was this global explosion of democracy and democratic institutions. And I think many of us at the time thought that this was a trend that would just continue for the foreseeable future. That now the world had awoken to the dangers of autocratic regimes and that the future of democracy was bright and would never recede in any way. Unfortunately, those hopes only lasted for a decade or so because what we've seen over the past several years is year after year of democracies in decline. There's any number of data sets and points you could take for this. This comes from Freedom House who looks at issues like functioning of government, freedom of expression of, of belief, rule of law. And you see that in the 41 established democracies, and that's a statement in itself, 194 member states of the UN, there are 41 we would call established democracies, at least from the standpoint of how Freedom House defines it, that 25 of those suffered overall declines in the past year, including the US. And what we've seen here, in, the, in this era of history and the decline of democracy is not democracy being overthrown from without. What we've seen is people being elected through democratic mechanisms and then eroding democracy from within. We've seen it in Poland, in Hungary, in Thailand. It's happened obviously in Russia, India, some degree in Israel, the US that people using democracy to undermine it from within. Uh, the Economist publishes a democracy index and this one from 2020 showed again, the US flawed. The US had been classified as a flawed democracy since 2007. But I think the key thing to notice about this democracy index is every region of the world in 2020 experienced a democratic retreat. You'll see a lot of names for it, democratic retreat, democratic rollback, democratic deconsolidation, democratic decline, but no region of the world was protected from this retreat in democracy. Evan Osnos is a journalist who has described it this way, and I'm struggling with, I was in Northern Ireland for a book tour a week ago, week and a half ago, came back, now I'm here, it's three hours difference. I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't see the sunset last night. I don't know where my body is right now, but I'm assuming if I can stay up late enough tonight that as twilight comes, if I'm outside reading, my eyes adjust. The sun goes down, it's darker and darker. My eyes adjust, my eyes adjust, I can still read. And at some point, it's simply too dark to read. 
Osno says, this is how democracy declines. It doesn't happen overnight, typically now by a coup, by an overthrow. It's like the setting of the sun. You adjust, you adjust, you adjust. You say, well, that law can't be that important. It's not a big deal. And then at some point, the adjustment is so severe that it's no longer there. The thing no longer exists. Uh, we've seen, again, this is from Freedom House, several indicators specifically in the US over the past several years, an 11 point decline in our democratic functioning. I think of significant concern is the degree to which people in the US perceive the state as legitimate. And again, if you work abroad, many of you do, you know that there are countries in Latin America, Eastern Europe, Africa, where there are questions of, is this state legitimate? We have those same questions here. Here you see in this polling piece that only 18% um, of people who voted for Trump believe that Biden was the actual winner of the presidential election. There's a large number of people in our country who believe that the current setting president in office and administration is not legitimately elected, not a legitimate representative of the people. When the people of a state have these questions about the legitimacy of the state, we become very worried about issues of domestic terrorism because what they're responding to in their minds is an illegitimate power holder, an illegitimate state. And what we would define as terrorism, they would see as freedom fighting. So in the paper I wrote for the Stanley Center, I said that the guardrails built into our constitutional democracy have been eroded under years of partisanship, polarization, the pursuit of power. And I know that much of this discussion has become very animated with the election of President Trump in 2016. Certainly that has accelerated many of the things we've talked about. But what I've also argued in this paper, and what I'm also very careful to talk about with groups is to say, this pattern of erosion was there long before President Trump. It was exacerbated, it was accelerated, but some of the decline in the functioning of our democratic institutions and the perception of public trust in democracy, that's been declining for decades. And we see that throughout the data. So it has led to a disintegration, I argue, of trust and faith in US democratic institutions. Any other country we look at in the world, if we'd say, you have this low of a degree of trust and faith in democratic institutions, we recognize that's a huge risk factor for that country moving forward. The second category of things I look at relate to conflict history. Here I'm looking at the history of identity related tensions in a country. Has a country had a prior genocide or politicide? To what degree does a country uh, struggle with significant past cultural trauma? Uh, this has been a, a key part of my work in Northern Ireland, has been a country that for 30 years lived under a cloud of violence that has left legacies of trauma that have been passed on generationally. Uh, the legacy of vengeance or group grievance, record of serious violations of international human rights and laws. And what I'm interested here when I look at countries from a risk perspective is I'm, I'm not as interested in what happened historically. I'm a political social psychologist, I'm not a historian. What I'm interested in is how is that history remembered, taught, processed, understood now? That's what matters for understanding risk now. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, memory has become hyper accelerated in the time we live because of the ways in which it can be shaped digitally. Most of you are old enough to remember as I do when social media happened and you finally understood what it was, which took a while for me to understand what people meant by it. It seemed like what a great opportunity for democratizing information and freedom, that this has tremendous potential to do some incredible good. And we've seen social media do some incredible good. I think fewer people, certainly not me, fewer people were aware of the potential for amplifying disinformation, misinformation, myth, fallacy, and untruth. And as Oxford said here in 2019, lowering levels of trust in media and democratic institutions. And we've seen the ways in which social media has done that 
uh, in recent years. And I think it's raised for us, uh, for me at least, a, a, a fascinating question having to do with freedom of speech. Do we consider, and certainly in the US, we've considered freedom of speech an absolute right. But sometimes is freedom of speech so dangerous and destructive that it ought to be a qualified right? Germany had to make these decisions about freedom of speech after the Holocaust. Is freedom of speech something that you absolutely have? Or is it qualified? Is some free speech so dangerous and destructive that it has to be policed? Um, what I've looked at here are issues related to memory. Um, I think this is very important for us in the US. We're a country founded on the near extermination of one people and the enslavement of another people. That's how we come to be who we are. It's not a place I speak in the US that you don't start with the land acknowledgement because it wasn't ours when it started. And the way it became ours was a destructive way that native communities still feel today, generation, generationally the impact of that. So how do we understand the founding realities of who we've come to be? If we construct memory in ways that are purposely blind to the tensions, violence, trauma, grievances, and egregious violations of the past and its direct impact on the present, that's destructive for us. That's not a healthy way to go about it. Every state, and I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how Arizona is dealing with it now. Every state is facing uh, concerns over what can be taught. K through 12, what cannot be taught, how it can be taught, how it cannot be taught. My sister's a high school teacher in South Carolina. Uh, she has interest, oddly enough, in genocide studies. Uh, she's taught for years a course in comparative genocide. Uh, last week, the school board told her the course had to be renamed to comparative history because comparative genocide was too controversial for some of the people in the school district. These type of things we're struggling with. How do we understand memory? I grew up a uh, child of the South, born and raised in Georgia. Um, it was all throughout K through 12. I learned history and I learned about the war of Northern aggression. That's what the civil war was. I had never heard the phrase to my mind, the civil war. I went to college, took my first history class. Professor stood up behind a podium like this and went on and on about the Civil War. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I kept looking around going to do other people. Am I in the wrong class? Half About 30 minutes in, he said something. And I was like, oh, he's talking about the War of Northern Aggression. Because that's what we've been taught it was. That was the South's response. This is an editorial, the first time we see this phrase appear from 1955. This is in response to the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision where policymakers in the South said, this is the second act of aggression the North has per, uh, perpetrated against us. So we're not gonna talk about the Civil War. We're gonna talk about the War of Northern Aggression. So when I visit, this is a lovely little village in Woodstock, Vermont that my wife and I occasionally go to. And you can see it says here that, I can't see it on here. So. Oh, yeah, nation in the War of Rebellion of 1861 to 1865, never understood it as a war of rebellion. It was something different to me. People growing up in Vermont, that's what the Civil War was. I think these questions of memory push us to ask ourselves, can a nation be so fragile as to collapse under the weight of its own memory? And that's what I wanna ask people who want to say we have to take off the plate things to talk about related to memory in the US. Are we so fragile as a state that we're gonna collapse under an honest assessment of the weight of how we came to be, what we've done and who we are. Third set of factors I look at are related to economic conditions, levels of economic development, discrimination, macroeconomic stability, economic deterioration, growth of informal economies and black markets. We have a lot more quantitative indicators for these risk factors. These are also the risk factors, generally speaking, we know less about directly as they relate to mass atrocities. Uh, in the US, we obviously don't have a low level of economic development, but we do, I would argue, have some high levels of economic inequality. 
Globally, I think we are still waiting to see what the impacts of COVID-19 will be globally on economic conditions. I think it's easy to speculate, I think reasonable to speculate, that it's going to exacerbate economic inequality around the world, that people who have will make it through this in ways that people who have not will not make it through. We've certainly seen escalations in unemployment around the world, especially among young men. We've seen increases in human trafficking and slavery tied to some of the economic desperation of this time. And as we've seen in our country, unequal access to social services and healthcare. As I said before, many of these trends we worry about in terms of risk have been here for a long time. And one of those we see here in the economic disparity in the black white income gap, this is a gap that has been held steady since we first started measuring it in 1970. And you'll see the gap well, absolutely, incomes have increased. The relative gap between blacks and whites in America have pretty well stayed the same. So when I look at these economic conditions from the standpoint of risk, what we tend to worry about is in situations of this type of economic inequality that deprived groups perhaps can resort to violence to address the economic inequality that they don't know how to address any other way. But sometimes privileged groups mobilize with violence to preserve that privilege. And we've seen that more often than not in countries with this type of economic inequality, that it's people in positions of privilege and power that mobilize with violence to preserve that privilege and power when they think it might be under attack. And then the final risk factor I look at is social fragmentation. I think this is one of the most important. I think in... Um, you know, I, I mentioned to you, I've grown up in the South, born and raised in a deeply divided society, taught in Germany. Um, the wall came down. I mentioned that, didn't I? I was there, the wall came down. Taught in Germany, deeply divided society. Worked in Northern Ireland extensively, deeply divided society. So something feels at home to me in these type of societies. And the thing that I see in common is this issue of social fragmentation. So here I'm looking at to what degree is a society divided by identity, religious, political, racial, tribal, ethnic, what types of divisions does society have? What are the demographic pressures? Typically, and, and we'll see this often, for instance, in Africa, but we're also seeing it now in Eastern Europe, the movements of large numbers of people refugees, fleeing crisis, going elsewhere, that elsewhere they go to is destabilized. It's unsettled because of the large flows of people coming in that you typically have no idea how long this, this population will be here. What does it mean for this population to become part of our community? Are they transient? Is it something we think about longer term? Unequal access to basic goods and services, gender inequalities, I think have been established as a fairly strong predictor of societies with deep social fragmentation and then political instability. Um, in the literature, we talk about these characteristics of these socially fragmented societies as deeply divided societies. One of the colleagues I taught with at Queen's University in Belfast is Adrian Guelke. And Adrian is a South African scholar uh, who came to Northern Ireland was a victim of an assassination attempt because of his work that he was trying to do on South, in South Africa that he was trying to bring into Northern Ireland. But Adrian gave us the concept of deeply divided societies. And he says, in these societies, social identity is central. Now, social identity can be defined any number of ways. Your, your major social identity could be religious. It could be political. It could be racial. It could be ethnic. It could be be gender, it could be any number of things. But in deeply divided societies, those social identities become central to how we think about ourselves. The differences between us become much more important in our minds than the similarities. And again, um, unfortunately, there are any number of ways we can choose to focus on social identities in divisive ways. But we're very concerned when those social identities become polarizing. So when they become so entrenched that the two spectrums or the two sides of social identity no longer speak, they're completely polarized, completely separate in that way, it leads to communities of fear. 
and isolation. Again, just uh, briefly during my time at Queens in Northern Ireland, when I would guest lecture in courses, one of the questions I'd often ask students is when did you first meet someone from the other side? If you're Protestant, when did you first meet a Catholic? If you're Catholic, when did you first meet a Protestant? Queens at the undergraduate level, it's the most prestigious university in Northern Ireland. At the undergraduate level, Queens is predominantly Northern Irish students. And in every class I spoke in, whether it's 20 students or 100 students, about 90% of them would say, the first time I met someone from the other side was when I came to Queens. They lived in a society so completely segregated by religion, by community activities, by sports, by neighborhoods, by where they shopped, what football team they followed, all these things that they were 18, 19, 20 years old before they knowingly met someone from the other side of the divide in Northern Ireland. That's how significantly polarized it is. Last month, many of you saw this poll from Monmouth University where it asked a sample of Americans, what is the one word you would use to describe American society, uh, the US today? And there's some interesting words in here. I mean, there's wonderful, Corrupt is a small one in there, so this is a word cloud. But what's the biggest word they saw? Divided was the most common response, divided. Um, most of us have lived long enough where divided would have appeared on this word cloud, but probably not as the biggest word. There are probably other things we would have picked, but a large number of Americans think of the state of the country today, and they think of it as divided. When I think about social identities and deeply divided societies in this way, what worries me, as I've already mentioned, is that they breed these communities of fear and isolation. That when you have these deep divisions, you don't speak with the people from the other side. You don't listen to their media. They don't listen to your media. You just, the interactions are cut off. And it leads to these silos that I think lead to fear and isolation. You have very little incentive in deeply divided societies for trust, cooperation, dialogue, long-term social exposure. You just don't do it that much. Again, I'll use Northern Ireland. They're pushing integrated schools, K through 12 is a possible solution. Any kid in Northern Ireland can go to an integrated school. Only 7% of them choose to. It's just not comfortable. But even though 7% go to the integrated school, what do they go home to? They go home to complete segregation. That's the context of their life. There is no long-term social exposure. And then it becomes really dangerous, and we've seen this in the U.S., when power holders start to manipulate these deep divisions because it exacerbates their own interest. It exacerbates their own power. Again, Northern Ireland, I, know, I realize now we're talking about the U.S., but I just keep going back. Northern Ireland has an election on May 5th. How are the political parties playing it? They're playing to the base. They're just going back to the polarized identities because that works to keep them in power. Moderation isn't gonna keep anyone in power. What concerns us about these types of social fragmentations is obviously the potential for violent conflict. Um, again, Adrian Gwelke has written about this and he said in deeply divided societies, even when you don't feel the fissures, they're there. It's always unstable. It's like, you know, if you live next to a fault line in California, it, you know it's there. Even if nothing's moving on a given day, you know there's a potential for something to move pretty drastically. In deeply divided societies, even when they look stable, you know the fissure is there. You know that something can happen that can reveal those deep divisions. And we've seen that certainly over the past several years in the U.S. with issues of race, that for some people, they, they have the privilege of stepping back and saying it's, it's not an issue, it's been resolved, we had a Black president, we can move forward, and then Minneapolis happens, then something else happens, and we're reminded that fissure, that division is still there, it's not something we come to grips with, and at times the ground shakes and it trembles and people are hurt and lives are destroyed. And we recognize the power of those deep divisions still. This has certainly been uh, recognized in terms of issues of domestic terrorism being a threat. Uh, the FBI director last March 
um, told the Senate Judiciary Committee agents to open up over 2,000 domestic terrorism inquiries in recent years. I have the privilege of working often, as I said earlier, with the FBI, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And for as long as I've done that work, what they've said to me is the biggest terrorist threat we face is domestic. It's from within. But policymakers get elected and get money based on focusing the terrorism threat out there. People who look different than us, people are going to come from over there and do damage to us. And that was certainly made all the easier after 9-11. But the terrorism threat domestically that has been most significant and problematic. We, we struggle with it in terms of our militaries and our militaries history with white nationalism. This is a report released by several colleagues from West Point, uh, US Army Military Academy, that yes, our military has a white nationalism problem. Uh, it runs deep in military. It is reinforced some ways by military structures and systems of, of honor and code that the military is having to struggle with what this means for us as a part of the security sector. So when I thought about these issues of social fragmentation, I argued that what's most concerning for us is when the social fragmentation is so severe that we see the other group as an intractable existential threat. This is a, a common question I'll get is, you know, what's the biggest red flag for us when we're thinking about the possibility of mass violence? And I think it is obviously when there's an other. But when the other starts to be talked about as an existential threat, they are a threat to my existence, to my religious identity, to my cultural identity, to my racial identity, to my national identity, maybe a threat to my physical existence. Any way that the other is seen as an existential threat, that's a significant concern for us. Um, in the aftermath of January 6th, like many people in the field, you're getting calls for interviews and thoughts on what happened. And the Stanley Center piece, when it was published in early November, I think had by like mid-November 30 hits or something. I mean, just wasn't doing anything. January 6th happened. People found the piece and looked back at it. But I think it, you know, as, as those discussions unfolded, I do think the sense of existential threat on January 6th was very dominant, particularly among white Christian nationalists who felt that there was an existential threat now to their privilege, to their identity, to the thing that they felt they had won, a hard-won sense of their identity. And it brought me back to uh, the what I think to be the wonderful series of books Taylor Branch has written about the American Civil Rights Movement. And I think it was in volume one of that three-volume set where Branch says, the Civil Rights Movement, its essential question for us was, will the U.S. choose whiteness or democracy? Will it choose Christianity or democracy? Will it choose privilege or democracy? And I think January 6th remind us that if that's the essential question of the Civil Rights Movement, that's still a question very much with us today. What does it mean to be a democratic country with democratic institutions? What does it mean for people's privilege who see, see it as a zero-sum game, that if they win, I have to lose? And I think anytime we see politics that way, it's dangerous. So in conclusion, um, you know, I think after January 6, you heard many people saying, this is not who we are. President Biden said it. Scores of people were saying, this is not who we are. This is not who we are. This is not who we are. I think the truth is, this is who we are. I mean, who we are is evidenced by what we do and what happens. And what happened on January 6, I think, was a troubling indicator of who we are. I said in the paper that if we were to notice these type of risk trends, any other country in the world, Latin American, African, Eastern Europe, we'd set up and say, my country's in some trouble. They need to pay attention to some things. But because it's a US, we tend to think that somehow we're protected, we're immune, that we wouldn't be subject to the same type of trouble. And I think I, I could say January 6 happened here precisely because we believed it could not happen here. I think there was a, 
a lack of recognition that something like this could happen here. And what concerns people who work in political violence is that we do know once we engage in political violence, it's easier to do it again. And we do know that many of the trends of risk we talked about today don't go away overnight because of a new presidential administration. They were here long before Trump. They were here long before Obama, long before many of the presidential administrations, and they'll be here long after. So I'll finish with these two quotes. Uh, James Baldwin, many of you know, an African-American author who said, not everything in this face can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I, I think the important thing for those of us who live and work in the U.S. is to recognize that none of these risk factors we talked about can be changed until we're willing to face them, until we're willing to realize it's not a perfect country, it's not the best country in the world, that democracy, uh, a historian, and I forget the name, once said, true democracy is never absolutely sure of itself. In other words, true democracy is always questioning itself. Can we be better? Where are the weaknesses? Where are the blind spots? And I think it's important for us to do the same. And President Biden captured this well in one of his early speeches where he said, your children and grandchildren are going to be doing their doctoral thesis on the issue of who succeeded, autocracy or democracy. And he's talking here globally, but he was talking very specifically about the U.S. That's what's at stake here. We've got to prove that democracy works, that democracy can work. And again, to go back to Baldwin's quote, that means facing up to a lot of things that we haven't done well, a lot of things that can be improved on to try to reduce risk and try to increase resilience. So that's me. I think we have a few minutes left for questions and discussion. Volker, do you have a way you want me to do this or? Okay. Yeah. Your discussion reminds me of the quote by Churchill that says, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest. And, and I think that's a really uh, good truism. Um, I've been finding in my own view of all of this that it seems to be somewhat intricately related to oligarchy and toxic masculinity. <laughs> that it seems like in this country, as the minorities gain more numbers, that white people are becoming more intransigent against any type of change. And so I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on this, these very, very, very wealthy people, mostly men, kind of running the entire world to their own advantage? It'd be nice to start off with an easier first question than that. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think you're right. There's certainly a intransigence to this that is difficult for for white Americans to respond to. The first two books I ever wrote, coming out of graduate school, my work was really focused on race relations in America, selfishly, because I'd grown up in that America. Uh, my father loved taking back road trips throughout the South, and I remembered the water fountains and bathrooms, I can still remember with colored and white, and asking the question, why? And in a way, I've never grown out of that question. So my first two books I wrote were on race relations in America. And when I would go to speak about those, I remember one event back, in, it was Atlanta, yeah, it was Atlanta, Georgia, did the talk, talking about what white privilege is and so on. And someone stood up, it was one of the very first questions and he said, and he could tell he was bothered. He was an older white man and it just was difficult for him. And he said, I just want, I just wish things were like they were in the fifties and sixties because it was so good. And it was good, I'm sure, for him. But just the tone deafness of not realizing there are a ton of people in this room. <laughs> this was, that wasn't very good. Females, people of color, so on. Uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual. I mean, he, he just couldn't get his mind around the change of it. And there was that desire for, can it just be what it was? Because there's nostalgia there where things were so good. And I do think that's, that's very difficult for a lot of people. The other issue you mentioned is one of toxic masculinity. Um, I, th I think we see that in politics. I, I mentioned the West Point study on white nationalism and military structures. That's the other thing they're concerned about is that culture of toxic masculinity and police forces around the country 
also worried about it. I, I do quite a bit of work with training police and um, very often this is what comes up in the discussion. There'll be relatively few women in the room and uh, when they speak, they will talk about the difficulty of working within a culture with that level of hyper toxic, whatever you want to call it, masculinity, and how difficult that makes a working environment. So I think those are both, um, you know, those are certainly significant concerns for sure. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to the back of the room to Jason and an online question before we return to the room. Yeah, this is from... Uh... Michael Rotenberg Schwartz, who you might know, he said, it's good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to um, see. This is, there's several questions in a row. So um, uh, uh, they're, all, they're all of a piece with one another. On the importance of social exposure to prevent social fragmentation, what do you do with the fact that in so many cases, neighbors kill neighbors? If families who knew each other for years can become violent against each other, why should we have faith that knowing each other will help? Why do people slowly start to believe propaganda against those they know? Or is it, as Father Dubois said the other day, it's less about people believing ideology and propaganda and more about their seizing opportunities to take property from others? Yep, thank you. Now, Father Dubois, and I have, I have uh, talked about this on a couple of occasions, and I think he's spot on. I, you know, in Becoming Evil, I talk about ideology. But I'm very careful because people want to think ideology or what you believe, that's what drives your behavior. Many times, though, in my experience interviewing perpetrators face to face, ideology works the opposite way, as Michael just described. Ideology comes after the behavior as a justification for why you did what you did, not a cause for it. So, for instance, I can think of one um, who's an extremist I interviewed in prison. And one of the questions we asked in those interviews is why the Tootsie? When did you start hating Tootsie? When did you start buying into the anti-Tootsie ideology? And he was very honest. He said, I never hated Tootsie. I was married to a Tootsie woman. So my best friends were Tootsie. I lived in a Tootsie neighborhood. But once they told me we could take what they had, we could get their roof, the sheet metal roof, which was um, very hard to get. We could get the goats. We could get the cow. I started killing them. And he said, once I started killing them, that's when I started hating them. That's a different way of understanding ideology. He didn't kill because he hated. He hated because he killed. That was a justification for it. And I hear that fairly often, actually, in many of the interviews of perpetrators. Many of them don't, don't understand the questions about ideology because they're looking at it as opportunistic. I had a chance to move up. I had a chance to step over someone else. I had a chance to gain, and I was given permission to do so. And then part of how they learn to live with themselves after the fact is to then buy into an ideology that justifies the horrible things they did. Um, give one more example. I'm sorry if I'm talking too much about Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland, a loyalist Protestant uh, paramilitary member had been given intelligence that he could cross the street, which is just hundred yards away to go into a Catholic neighborhood, which he'd never been into in his whole life, but that there was an IRA man on the second floor of the building in bed, and he would go in and kill them. He crossed the street, went up to second floor, five or six shots into whoever was in bed, went back home. Uh, next day, found out he killed someone's grandmother. Bad intelligence. Wasn't an IRA guy. It's a Catholic woman, someone's grandmother. I interviewed him, and he's actually a high-ranking political figure now in Northern Ireland. And I asked him the question, how did you, does that linger with you? Do you feel badly about it? How did you respond to it? And he said, no, it was, I, if it weren't for me, we would have a united Ireland. I was doing the right thing for the right reason, and I can live with that mistake. His ideology here both compelled him before the action, but more importantly for him, had really become the justification for how he could live with himself, that he took an innocent life just on the basis of bad intelligence. Yes. If we were to move America from being a declining democracy to an improving democracy, what kinds of things do you think individuals, government officials, nonprofit leaders, faith leaders, and community people could specifically do to move us in the right direction? No, it's a great question. I'm going to go back here quickly. Don't look at this. It'll just give you a headache. 
Um, but yeah, if we looked at these, you know, these four categories of risk I laid out, I tend to, and I don't think this is by nature, I think it, it was just the focus of the project was on understanding risk. But every one of those risk factors is like a coin with another side. And that other side is resilience. And the question you're asking, which is a key one, is what are the specific things we can do to build resilience? So for instance, when we talk about state legitimacy deficit, some significant part of that is gonna be what are the, what's the work we do as citizens and policymakers to restore faith in the electoral process? that the elections work their way, the way they're supposed to, the elections are fair, that all of us have an opportunity to vote, that they work the way they're supposed to do. Those type of, when we think of risk factors, if we just think of the other side of it, I think that gets us to the productive side of saying, this is something we can do. And again, I, I'm not, don't ever want to come across as democracy is an easy thing. We just have to do it. It's not, it's a difficult thing. And, and countries are at different levels of where they struggle with it. Uh, several years ago, I was on an election monitoring commission uh, for a country I can't name. But we went to the country. It was a relatively new democracy. We monitored the election results. And the officials came to us the day after the election and said, it went great. You won't believe how great it went. We had 130% turnout. <laughs> and we're in a position of having to say... <laughs> You know, I think they used to work in Chicago, but we had to, we're in that position of having to say 130% turnout is not great. That means that some people voted twice and we can't, that's not how democracy functions. Now, again, it's a difficult thing to pull off, but I do think the question you asked is a crucial one, is, is, is to say democ democracy is not self-sustaining. There have to be things that we do as an individual that help sustain it. How do we remember, teach, process, and understand our conflict history? I mean, these are all things we can be very intentional participants in. Thank you for the question. Um, you want me to go or? Yeah, go okay, all right. Um, uh, Dr. Wallace, thank you so much. Um, two very important things I'm taking away from this. One is you gave um, a talk that had theoretical aspects, it had concrete aspects, but it was about, when you're talking about the US, you're talking about the US and you're talking about the details of what's going on now. You weren't saying, hey, this kind of looks like 1932 mm -hmm. Germany or you know 1993 Rwanda or something like that. Right. And I think that's so important in this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you're able to, to take that and to get at all of these important factors. Again, learning from some of that history, but not pretending we're in the same, you know, we're just repeating a history again. And I, and I think that's so important if we're gonna be effective in confronting the issues that, that you're, you're raising here, which are profound. Okay. Um, my question to you, um, and, and I sense a kind of tension in, in, in your talk around this issue. Um, at, at times, it seems like you're saying, well, we have had some good things and now we're declining. Mm -hmm. At other times, you're pointing to things in our history that suggest maybe we haven't ever been democratic. Mm -hmm. um, that that what we're seeing now, and you said this at one point, you know, what we're seeing now is a sort of surface level exposure of what has been there in different ways for our history. Right. And I would even look at, you know, not in any disrespect to the FBI folks, but they're probably at their best in, in their history right now, in terms of dealing with these kinds of things compared to say the J. Edgar Hoover period and so forth, where a lot of FBI work was racist and it was in service of racist state. And so you could make some arguments that some of our institutions are actually improving um, and are more democratic than they've been before. So how do, how do you resolve that tension and what's the message to people who are worried about the US right now without saying, hey, we've been through this a billion times before, we'll be fine kind of thing. No, I appreciate that, Henry. It's a great question, and, and you're, you're spot on in identifying that tension. I, I never want to speak about this particular topic in the sense of it's worse now than it's ever been, because it's not. Tons of ways, and you've identified a specific institutional way, there are tons of things we're doing now that are, that are significant improvements in how we've been. And, you know, most of you are... are old enough, and I'm not looking at the ones who are younger, but most of us are old enough to recognize that, yeah, back in the day, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there were things said 
things done that were considered accept, socially acceptable behaviors that we no longer do. So I, I do want to, by and large, no longer do. So I want to recognize those tremendous strides we've made in those type of improvements. But I also don't want that to gloss over the fact that there are fundamental cracks here in the foundation, in the structure of who we are that I don't think we've ever addressed. And, and I think our history of, of race, of slavery, of genocide, these are things that I, I think we still struggle to address in terms of national identity. So I am looking more for the foundational, fundamental issues that, again, we may have glossed over some of them, and we've made improvements in some ways, but I, th I think still things to be considered. But I appreciate your opening remark about how, you know, I, I do think when uh, President Trump was elected, there was this almost mass hysteria among some people of, uh, this is 1932, 33 Germany, and these things are happening and so on. As I said, a lot of things accelerated over those four years, but all those things were in place before. I mean, nothing was created in 2016 in terms of division that wasn't already there. It just accelerated to such a remarkable degree. So I've always wanted to be careful about trying to place this in a much broader context than, than it was being placed at times. Um, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Since uh, my my focus, as, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, is on propaganda, um, and we'll replace genocide with mass atrocities. But to your point about social fragmentation, if propaganda is so pervasive, as in every virtually every moment of our lives, mm -hmm. is, is, in, is just infused with it, um, how does one, in your opinion, um, go about? Um, severing that and incentivizing people to not view the means of their security and prosperity as essentially the subjugation and or marginalization of others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I hope we end with an easier question than these are, <laughs> are starting to become. Um, in the 2017 piece I wrote for the Center, I think it was the Center for Human Law and Policy, humanitarian law and policy, I, I had referenced an article there about media consumption that I always found interesting. And it, it had to do with, over the years, the degree to which people's media consumption had become increasingly polarized. And, and to the extent that a lot of the propaganda comes through media consumption, I mean, clearly we've seen that um, people now have their own choice of media channels to consume. They have their own choice of propaganda to consume. And I think all of us do it. I'll, I'll be, I don't mean to um, um, put anyone off, but I mean, just my own bias. I, I don't watch Fox News. I, I feel like I can't watch it. I, I just, and feel, feel happy or feel I can go on. And that's just me. Others of you would say the same thing about CNN or MSNBC. But the fact that we say those things, it just shows the degree to which we, we are certainly able now through social media and through uh, media writ large to pick and choose the directions we want to go. And so propaganda has become commodified, I think, in that way and very easily digestible for us because we have the luxury of making those choices in ways that, you know, in Rwanda in 1994, that very few people owned a television. Most everyone had a radio and that radio pretty much had the one radio station that the government used for propaganda purposes and for actual instructions on killing purposes. So it's very different than that now, but I think it's, you know, I don't have an easy answer to what you ask is how do we fix that? What are the things we do? And the trite things that college professors like myself have always told students of, well, pay attention to other sides. If you read the New York Times, read the Wall Street Journal, do both of these things. I mean, the truth is very, very few of us do that. We are, we have comfort zones with where we want to stay and we tend to stay with those. Yeah. 
So Arizona just passed a law that says that you can teach the Holocaust, but Uh you cannot say that the Germans were bad or wrong. Okay, so you have Florida saying you can't say gay. Clearly unconstitutional legislation that will have to be litigated or voted out. But in the meantime, these schools now are influencing young minds. And so therefore, I kind of get this hopeless feeling like, yeah, it will eventually get turned over, hopefully. But in the meantime, you've got children being, you know, don't, are not hearing about gay or LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. You've got them not being able to know that the Nazis actually were wrong, that they actually did Mm -hmm. commit crimes. I mean, where do you go with that? It's, I find it highly discouraging and highly depressing when you have these thoughtless, like small-minded state legislatures basically dictating what people can say. Yeah. In this country. No, I appreciate the, the point you made in the v- final sentence there was that, and this connects to, to something you had mentioned as well, is that the way our system of federalism works, states have significant power and leverage. And many of these national political battles that have consumed so much of us for the past several years are now state battles. And things are happening at a state level which people aren't as aware of and are passing through legislatures without much attention, but have an impact. And where your comments resonate with me is we at Keene State, we have a Holocaust genocide studies major, the only such major in the US. Most of our students are double majors. Most of those are education majors. We're teaching them how you teach Holocaust and genocide studies, middle school, high school. Now, because we live in a state that's passed similar legislation, we're trying to figure out what that legislation means for how we teach our teachers. And they're asking us what what can be taught, what can't be taught, what are the, because, and this goes a bit to your question as well about issues of comfort. I think the best education happens in situations of discomfort. I mean, when when students are pushed to that point of these type of self-insights and inflicted insights, but we have legislation saying, no, education is about comfort. It's not about pushing people to ask these hard questions. And the question is, how long can we sustain that? And I think many of us, and we're seeing this now in higher ed, as our, our pandemic students are coming in. They're coming in more passive, um, less likely to engage. The masking just makes it all the more difficult for them to engage. And now we're gonna have another question with a generation of students coming in from some states where they're gonna be like me. They're gonna go, what do you mean it's a civil war? Is a war of Northern aggression? I mean, they've been taught memory in a different way. And that's gonna be a, an adjustment for all of us. I wanna respect the time. I yeah, I think about. we've uh, got time for one last question and I'm the moderator. So I'm gonna take a, a prerogative here and ask okay. that last, sure. last question and we'll bring it to a close. Um, I, I, I'm uh, very grateful that you brought out this this issue that the United States has been a uh, flawed democracy uh, since well before 2016, 2015, et cetera. Would you say a little bit about, as opposed to a full democracy, would you say a little bit about what the um, uh, what the conditions are and what sort of take us back, remind us a little bit about what that looked like and what's happening in 2007 in, the, in that period running up to? Yeah. It's, it's. Um, yeah, I think when we look at, at fully functioning democracies, and you can go to all these data sets that talk about democratic institutions have their own indicators for what that means. So Freedom House has a list of indicators. The Economist Intelligence and uh, Democracy Index, I think, has 60 different indicators of what full democracy looks, looks uh, like. But generally, we're, we're looking at things like freedom of expression. Our last question just talked about, the question just asked about things that really are limiting freedom of expression, freedom of belief, the full participation in terms of voting for people. Uh, We have taken, I believe, most recent figure I've seen is that in the past five years, 17 states have made it more difficult for people to vote rather than less difficult for people to vote. So voting rights are being rescinded in some significant ways at the state level. Um, I think there are are, uh, rule of law considerations that are important. Again, I work with security sector around the world trying to establish what does good, equitable, fair, humane rule of law look like. I think the US is struggling with what rule of law 
looks like and what that means, particularly for policing. Um, I, I'll use this example because uh, I told them I would use it when they gave it to me. I was, you know, I do these policing things all over everywhere. Someone came to me and said, why don't you do it in Keene? That's where I'm based. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know why I don't do it in Keene. So I went, 30 person police department, did the training that's been pretty well received, I think, elsewhere. God, they hated it. <laughs> the evaluation, someone had just scrawled total propaganda across it. And the things we got at coffee breaks from people were, oh, the people who need training is the community. We don't need that training. They need the training. They're the ones misbehaving. We're the targets. You can take police lives anytime you want to. We can't take theirs. They can take ours. So there was a siege mentality to it, at least locally, that makes you feel like the rule of law here is difficult from the perspective of the people enforcing the rule of law. So those are things we, uh, some of the things we look at as well. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.